4.5 derivatives and the shape of a graph. In this section, we're going to learn about the first derivative test, which uses the mean value theorem to classify extrema. And we're also going to learn about a second derivative test, which essentially does the same thing, but in a different way. We'll start by building the first derivative test. So corollary three of the mean value theorem showed us that if the derivative of a function is positive on an interval, then the function's increasing. And if the derivative were de negative, then the function is decreasing. And we have a few pictures here where we've drawn a function and we found a couple of tangent lines and we can show that the slope of those tangent lines is positive for an increasing function. The slope is negative for a decreasing function. Maxima and minima occur at the points where the derivative switches from positive to negative. So, for example, at the x value a, we see that we have a critical point here. And we can, can qualify this as a maximum because our derivative goes from positive to negative. And it switches right at that critical point. In other words, we have an increasing function, we have a corner, and then it switches to a decreasing function. And that function continues to decrease until we reach the next critical point that occurs at B. And this critical point is a minimum because the derivative goes from a negative value to a positive value, and it switches right there at x equals b. In other words, we're going from a decreasing function to an increasing function. And if we keep following along our curve, we'll find another point, another critical point at c. And we check to see if we can classify this as a maximum or a minimum by looking at the signs of the derivatives. So to the left of c, our derivative is positive. For this to be a maximum, the derivative on the right-hand side would need to switch to negative so that the function starts to decrease. However, that's not the case here. Notice that for the maximum we found at a, the derivative was opposite signs, so it went from positive to negative. For the minimum that we found at b, the derivative went from negative to positive. At c, we have positive on the left, positive on the right, which means this point is neither a max or a min, it's something else. So this is not an extrema. Keep following along our curve, we find another critical point at D. We look at the derivative on the left, which is positive, derivative on the right is negative, this classifies as a maximum. I like to use plus and minus, but I also like to use lines to represent slope. So if we go back to the point at A, our slope was increasing, then decreasing. So we have a max. If we go back to B, our slope was decreasing to the left of B, increasing to the right of B. That looks like a min. At C, we had increasing and increasing, so that doesn't look like a max or a min. At D, we had a positive slope on the left, a negative slope on the right. This again gave us a maximum. So this is the idea of the first derivative. Sorry, my door just slammed. This is the idea of the first derivative test. What we'll do is find our critical points, calculate the derivative around the critical points, and look at the increasing, decreasing signs to classify max and min. So theorem 4.9 summarizes that. It says if the derivative changes from positive to negative, then you're at a maximum. So if you go from positive to negative, you're at a max. The second part says that if you go from negative to positive, so negative to positive, you are at a min. And if f prime the derivative has the same sign on the left and the right, so 
positive positive or negative negative, then you don't have a max or a min. So this is neither. So we have those three cases. Our problem solving strategy, first thing we're going to do is find all the critical points. And then we're going to analyze the sign of our derivative in each of the intervals that are formed by our critical points. And then we're going to use the first derivative test and um, the results from step two to classify maximum, minimum, or neither. Let's give it a try. So let's use the first derivative test to find the location of all local extrema for the given function x cubed minus 3x squared minus 9x minus 1. First thing we're going to do is find our critical points. What this means is we're going to take our derivative and set it equal to 0. The derivative of this function will look like 3x squared minus 6x minus 9. If we set that equal to 0, we can see that we're able to divide off a factor of 3. Whoops, my 9 turned into a 3 all of a sudden. There we go. If we divide off a factor of 3, we end up with x squared minus 2x minus 3 is equal to 0. We can solve this any way we want to. I'm going to factor it to x minus 3, x plus 1. This tells us that x is equal to 3 or x is equal to negative 1. Those are the critical points. So we have two critical points. One at x equals 3 one at x equals negative one. We're going to draw those critical points on a number line. So I've got a number line. I know I have x equals negative one and x equals positive three. I don't need to go through and label all of the numbers in between. First, start off by putting the x values of your critical points because those are what breaks up the interval into the subintervals. So these two critical points created three subintervals. We have the left interval, the center interval, and the right. And to use the first derivative test, we need to find what the value of the slope is, or the sign of the slope in the left interval, what is the sign of the first derivative in the center interval, and what is the sign of the first derivative in the right interval. So we'll pick a test point in each interval. So for the left interval, I'm going to pick a test point of negative 2. In the center interval, I'm going to pick a number between negative 1 and 3. I'll pick 0. And then for the right interval, I need a number that's larger than 3. I'll pick 4. So we pick these test points. We'll plug them into the first derivative to calculate if the derivative is positive or negative. So in the left interval, we picked the test point of negative 2. We'll plug negative 2 into our derivative to determine if we have a positive or negative derivative. So we plug that into the 3x squared minus 6x minus 9. So we get 3 times 4 plus 12 minus 9, well, we have 24 minus 9, which is 15. 
meaning the derivative in that left interval is always positive. So I'm going to draw a plus sign to say that our derivative is positive over here. I'm also going to draw an increasing arrow to say that the function is increasing in that entire interval. We're going to repeat this process for the center subinterval as well as the right subinterval. So the test point for the center interval was 0. So we'll plug 0 into our derivative. We get 3 times 0 squared minus 6 times 0 minus 9. That simplifies to be negative 9. So the derivative in that entire center interval is less than 0. So for this one, we will put a negative symbol for that interval. And then I'll also draw a decreasing arrow to represent that the function is decreasing in that subinterval. And then lastly, we have the right interval. In the right interval, we pick the test point of 4. So I need to plug 4 into my derivative to determine what the sign is. Now, so far, every time I've plugged a test point in, I plug it into the first definition we have for our derivative. However, in this last step, I'm going to use the factored form. So instead of using 3x squared minus 9, uh, sorry, minus 6x minus 9, I'm going to look at this as 3 times x minus 3 times x plus 1. That will get us the exact same thing that we have. Um, but here's the trick, that when I plug 4 in, I can quickly decide if this is giving me positives or negatives. So 3 times 4 minus 3 times 4 plus 1. I have a positive number times a positive number times a positive number, which means this derivative is positive. In the right subinterval, the derivative is positive, meaning we're increasing. If that felt super strange to you, you do not need to use the shortcut of looking at positive times positive times positive, or in some cases where there will be a negative. Um, but I would encourage you to give that a try because it can quickly calculate the sign of the first derivative. We don't care what the value is of the first derivative, we just care if it's positive or negative. So we have tested each of our subintervals. We can see that around the critical point, negative 1, our function goes from increasing to decreasing, which is a max. And around the critical point at x equals 3, the function goes from decreasing to increasing, which is a minimum. So this problem asked us to find the location of all the extrema. We have done that. There is a max at x equals negative 1. We could plug negative 1 into our function to calculate what the max is. And we have a min at x equals 3. Now the second part of this problem says to use a graphing utility to confirm your results. So I'm going to pull up Desmos and show you how to do that right now. So we've got Desmos pulled up. We're going to use this graphing calculator to help us confirm our results. The first thing we need to do is graph the original function. So we're going to type into the calculation field the function f of x, which was x cubed minus 3x squared minus 9x minus 1. And looking at the graph as it is originally given to us, we're missing some of the uh, picture. You can see the blue curve, and then all of a sudden it drops down below the screen. We don't know what's going on. So we need to fix that. And to fix that, all we have to do is zoom out. So I'm just rolling my mouse wheel there to zoom out. And now I can see the complete graph. And let me change this to projector so it's a little more bold. And if we wanted to, we could change the x and y uh, values for the graph. 
to set the window. So let's let x go from negative 5 up to 7. So that just reset our graph so that we can really see what's going on here. Now we found some critical points at x equals 1 and at x equal, sorry, negative 1 and at x equals positive 3. And we can see those on our graph. At negative 1, the function value is at positive 4. And notice that as soon as you move away from x equals negative 1, either to the left or to the right, the function value starts to decrease. So it's smaller. And then we have another minimum that happened at 3. x equals 3. The minimum value of the function there is negative 28. And if we want to, we can plot that by just saying the point at x equals negative 1, the function evaluated at negative 1. And we can also do the point at 3 with the function evaluated at 3. So we have our max and our min there. Awesome. And just for good measure, to compare this to Rolle's theorem and to uh, the mean value theorem, I want to show you that the derivative is equal at those points. So I'm going to use Desmos to calculate my derivative by typing f prime, and then I'm going to ask it to evaluate the derivative at negative 1. It's equal to 0, which is exactly what we thought it should be. I'm also going to ask Desmos to calculate the derivative at 3. Also equal to 0. We have the horizontal tangent line at each of those um, critical points. And if we wanted to, we could double check our test points. So our derivative at negative 2, that was for the left interval, we got a positive number. So our function was increasing to the left of our green point. And we can also calculate the derivative at 0, which was the test point for the interior subinterval, the center. That's a negative derivative. We can see that that tells us the function is decreasing between the green and the purple points. And then lastly, we can calculate the derivative to the right of our minimum. And the test point we used there was positive 4. That gave us a positive slope, which tells us the function increases after the purple point. So the analytical work that we do here matches exactly with the graph that we found before. Uh, the good news is that you still can use the graph to confirm your results, but now you have a way to come up with these values for max and min without having to reach for a graphing calculator. Let's try another example of using the first derivative test. So just like the last time, we are going to start off by finding the first derivative to find critical points. So let's find f prime. So we have 5 times 1 third times x to the 1 third minus 1 minus 5 thirds x time uh, to the uh, 5 thirds minus 1. And let's clean that up a little bit. So we have 5 thirds x to the negative 2 thirds minus 5 thirds x to the positive 2 thirds. Negative exponents means that that factor belongs in the denominator. So we really have 5 over 3 times x to the 2 thirds minus 5 thirds x to the positive 2 thirds. We can get a common denominator here. Um, we have 3 in both denominators, but we need an x to the 2 thirds. Once we have that, we can write them over the same denominator. In the numerator, we will have 5 minus 5 x to the 4 thirds. And since they both have both terms in the numerator have a factor of 5, we can factor it out.
Now that we have our first derivative completely factored, we will set it equal to zero and solve for critical points. Now this is where your algebra skills are going to need to come in handy. This equation can be solved by just taking the numerator equal to zero and then the denominator. When the numerator is equal to zero, the first derivative is equal to zero. When the denominator is equal to zero, that first derivative is undefined or does not exist. Both cases will give us critical points. So our numerator looks like 5 times 1 minus x to the 4 thirds. Set that equal to 0. We can divide the 5 off. Then we just have 1 minus x to the 4 thirds equals 0. I'm going to add that x to the 4 thirds to both sides. So now I have 1 is equal to x to the 4 thirds. Now 4 thirds is like saying I have x raised to the power of 4 and then I also have x being cube rooted. Now the shortcut would be to just raise both sides of the equation to the power of 3 fourths. But when we do that, we need to think about what we're doing and if that's going to eliminate negatives and positives from being possible solutions. So looking at the equation, we see that the original exponent was even, meaning if x is a negative number, the 4 exponent is going to erase the negative from that. So when we do the cube root, sorry, when we raise this to the 3 fourths power, we don't have to worry about taking a root of a negative number. So the fourth root is not going to be a problem at all because we would have already fixed the negative beforehand. So then we have a positive root on the left side, sorry, an even root on the left side, which means this would be plus or minus 1 raised to the power of 3 fourths is equal to x. In other words, plus or minus 1 are the solutions for x here. So we have two critical points. We're going to place those on a number line. We have negative 1, we have positive 1. But we might have other critical points if we look at the derivative denominator equal to 0. So that's 3 times x to the 2 thirds. Set that equal to 0. Divide the 3 off. Raise everybody the power of 3 halves. We get x equals 0, which is our third critical point. We'll also place that on the number line. So we have four subintervals. The interval to the left of negative 1, the interval between negative 1 and 0, the interval between 0 and positive 1, and then the interval to the right of positive 1. We need to pick a test point for each one of those intervals. I'll pick negative 2, negative 1 half, positive 1 half, and positive 2. Notice that you're not allowed to pick a test point that is equal to the critical points. I wouldn't want to test any of these critical points, negative 1, 0, or positive 1, into my derivative because I already know the derivative is 0 or undefined at those points. So we'll pick test points around the critical points so we can see what the function's up to in those subintervals. So for the first derivative test, we are going to plug each of these test points into our derivative to see if we get a positive or a negative. I'm not going to use the first form of the derivative, though. If we look back at that, it's kind of messy. And evaluating that function at different x values doesn't seem like a lot of fun, especially if all we need is to know if it comes out as a positive or a negative. So I'm going to move down to this last version of the derivative that we had after we simplified it by factoring, and I'm going to look at that version. If all we care about is whether or not this expression comes out to be positive or negative, there's only a few things that we need to focus on. 
first of all, the five out front, that's always positive. So I don't need to worry about what that does to my calculation. Same with the three. Those are both positive numbers. Never going to change this from a positive to a negative with those two factors. But then also, if I look at the denominator, this is saying x to the two-thirds power, which you could look at as the cube root of x being squared. Now, any number that's squared comes out to be a positive. So it doesn't matter what I plug in for x, my denominator is always positive. Just like the 5, just like the 3. The only place where we have potential for a negative or a positive change is going to be in the yellow box, this factor in the numerator. So we really only need to plug the test points into that expression. So we will find the derivative at negative 2. We just care if it's positive or negative. If I plug negative 2 into the yellow box, I get 1 minus negative 2 to the 4 thirds, 1 minus negative 2 raised to the 4 thirds, type that into your calculator, and I get a negative number, which means our derivative is less than 0 for that test point. We'll do it again for negative 1 half. I only need to plug 1 half into the yellow box, so I'll do 1 minus negative 1 half to the 4 thirds. Plugging that into the calculator, I find a positive answer, so this would come out to be positive. Try positive 1 half in our derivative. Also get the derivative as positive. And then lastly, our derivative at 2. So I have 1 minus 2 to the 4 thirds, and that comes out to be negative. So I'm going to go back and use my arrows to represent where the function is decreasing or increasing. So on my left subinterval, we were decreasing, and then we were increasing, increasing again, and then decreasing on the far right interval. That tells us that at negative 1, we have a max. At 0, we don't have a max or a min because the derivative is positive on both sides of 0. And then at 1, we have a, oops, I classified negative 1 incorrectly. At negative 1, we have a min. At positive 1, we have a max. Close call there. And if we were to graph this in a graphing calculator, we could confirm that. So let's switch over to Desmos. To confirm our results, I'll start by graphing the original function, which was 5 times x to the 1 third minus x to the 5 thirds. And we can see the curve completely, so we don't need to worry about zooming out or in. Um, we have our critical points that we found. So at negative 1, comma f at negative 1, we found our minimum, which we accurately identified using the first derivative test. At 0, we found a critical point, but we said it wasn't a max or a min. And this graph confirms that. And then lastly, at positive 1, we claimed to have found a maximum using the first derivative test, and our graph confirms that.